Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Ann Evers Hits. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator here at Copperfield's Books and I will also be your host for the evening. Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. Thanks for joining us in this virtual event community to help keep us feeling connected. As COVID-19 continues to endanger the future of independent bookstores like us, you can show your support for Copperfields and help keep us alive by purchasing a book through our online store. We thank you for your continued support. I'm also thrilled to announce that all nine of our stores are now open for inside service and curbside pickup every day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So just a couple quick housekeeping items before I introduce tonight's author. We will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, information on how to purchase Anne's latest title, as well as links to purchase her previous work, and we'll also include my contact details for reserving your copy and for follow-up information. Anne has so kindly offered to sign book plates for those of you who purchased tonight's book through Copperfields. We'll touch more on this later in the event, but uh, I will also share details in the chat box while Anne is speaking, so just kind of keep your eye out. Um, the last thing is the Q&A box will be your go-to tonight with any question or comments for the author. Uh, the format will feature 30 to 45 minutes of speaking and will be followed by a live Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see an icon that says Q&A. Please submit your questions here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce tonight's author. Proud to be a fifth generation San Franciscan, author, author Ann Evers Hits has had a long interest in San Francisco history, its lore and legends. A graduate of UC Berkeley, Hits is a writer, editor, and project manager who has had her own communications consulting firm in San Francisco for 25 years. Anne is the author of Lost Department Stores of San Francisco, San Francisco's Ferry Building, and Emporium Department Store. Tonight, she is here with us to discuss her latest title, The Lost Department Stores of San Francisco. I'm so excited to hear and see what you have for us tonight, and I'm pleased to hand it over to you, Anne. Jamie, I think something is freezing here, but um, I hope you can hear me. I can hear you. Good, good. You, you froze there for a sec. We've been having a little, some little glitches with our uh, internet. Uh, so I'm just keeping my fingers crossed this all goes smoothly. But thank you everybody for coming. I'm really thrilled to be here to talk about my new book, Lost Department Stores of San Francisco. If I was in a room with all of you in the pre-COVID days, I'd probably ask for a show of hands about who used to shop at the different stores or worked maybe on the roof of the Emporium at Christmas, maybe you were an elf, or if, what you liked about going downtown. But since we're just virtual, then we'll just uh, keep going here. I thought I'd give a little background about why I got interested in the topic. Um, there's actually a family connection. My great-great-grandfather, Frederick Wilhelm Dorman, was one of the founders of the Emporium. So I'd heard about it a lot as I was growing up, um, although our family got out of it in the 50s. But um, when I felt like exploring more, I realized there was some material for a book. So I wrote a book about the Emporium in 2014. And what I discovered with that book was there was a real vein of nostalgia for these old stores. Uh, Leah Garchik mentioned the book that I was going to be doing a signing in one of her columns, and over 60 people showed up um, many of whom were former employees of the Emporium, and they brought memorabilia. They were wearing their little uh, employee pins. It was really quite something. So when I was looking for an idea for the next book, I uh, thought, well, maybe I will do one on six of the old stores. So that's how this one came to be. 
And so I look at City of Paris, White House, iMagnon, uh, Emporium, Gumps, and um, did I get them all? White House, wait. Anyway, there are six. <laughs> Can't quite remember them all. Um, so what I'd like to do is take a look back at the colorful characters who founded these stores. They were really an integral part of San Francisco and its history and um, some more about the stores themselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to disappear a little bit while I get the slideshow going and then I'll come back at the end and Jamie and I will handle the questions together. Okay, so here we are taking a look back at old San Francisco. I must say retail is in quite a nosedive right now compared to 100 years ago. Uh, every day, especially with the pandemic, someone uh, declares bankruptcy. I think it was Brooks Brothers yesterday. So all these old guard stores are um, not able to maintain because there's just too much competition from either a pandemic or uh, online shopping and other, other things that are just not uh, making it easy. It's a brutal environment. So let's start with a typical holiday visit from the perspective of a San Francisco kid, uh, author Frank Dunnigan. He wrote me a note and he said, our family's holiday shopping in the late 1950s and early 1960s always began with a ride on the El Terravel, El Terravel streetcar. As it slid past Fifth Street and stopped in front of the Emporium, it seemed that most of the passengers disembarked all at once. Through the crowded main aisle, we would go as mom and grandma made a few purchases from the notions department before taking the back elevators up to the enormous toy department on the fourth floor. Mom would do her shopping there as grandma took the kids to see Santa and the roof rides. From there, we would cross Market Street for lunch at Woolworths and a bit more shopping, often candy, candles, and other holiday items, and then on to see the tree at City of Paris. While mom and grandma shopped for clothing and gifts, kids insisted on viewing the thousands of ornaments and twinkling lights up close from the balconies on each floor. We then walked to Grant Avenue to see and smell the lavish floral and fur decorations at Podesta Baldaki, ooing and eyeing at the windows at Gums, and then a bit more shopping at the White House. Walking back to Union Square, there would be a stop in the cosmetics department at iMagnon while the ladies might pay a visit to the store's lavish lounge. If the kids were especially well behaved, there might be a sweet treat from Blum's right next door before heading home. So that was my kind of experience growing up. Um, and let's take a closer look at the immigrants who made these stores what they were. What's the biggest difference between them now? Um, as Ellen Magnan Newman, one of the creative minds behind Joseph Magnan and a great granddaughter, Mary Ann Magnan, founder of iMagnan, put it, the best fertilizer is the foot of the owner on the soil and every store the owner was present. I was lucky enough to be able to interview uh, Mrs. Newman twice, and she was extremely helpful, especially with the Joseph Magnum material. So what do we have surrounding Union Square now? We have Saks Fifth Avenue, Apple, Tiffany, Macy's, Bulgari, Louis Vuitton, and Williams Sonoma. Really, none of those is locally owned, although Williams Sonoma was founded locally. So let's do a quick introduction of each of the main players, then talk about their retail enterprises. Here we have Paul Verdier of the city of Paris, a descendant of the founders, Emile and Felix Verdier. He was very present and even had a private dining room for guests located in the cellars, uh, behind the cellars in the store's famed Normandy Lane. Here we have Raphael Weil of the White House. He emigrated from Alsace-Lorraine in northeastern France in 1854 and quickly worked his way up in the retail trade. Gertrude Atherton, an, an author, recounted in her book, My San Francisco. He was a rather short, stout man with a beaming, intelligent face. One rarely entered the White House without meeting him, for he knew all his customers personally and liked to chat with them. 
I cannot remember how many times he informed me that he had known five generations in my family, but he then liked to divert the conversation to France, to which he was still devoted with his heart, if not his honest and enterprising head. Then there were the three generations of Gumps, starting with Solomon Gump, who arrived in the US in 1850 from Heidelberg, Germany, joining his sister and brother-in-law uh, in San Francisco in 1863. So he took a while to get west. He founded S&G Gump with his brother Gustav, and they specialized in gilded mirrors and huge paintings, many of which hung in saloons. Uh, and since barroom brawls were so common, there was a steady stream of business because the mirrors and artwork were always getting shot up. Um, so they, they kind of, their business took off quickly. Plus the money on, the new money on Knob Hill wanted art for their mansions. They wanted to keep up uh, with the Stanfords, the Huntingtons, the Crockers and the Floods. So Richard Gump, who was Solomon's grandson, said that it wasn't that Solomon had such great taste in art. The nudes were actually of Solomon's lady friend, a European actress. Anyway, so Solomon's son, Abraham L, otherwise known as A.L. Gump, was really the driving force in building Gump's reputation as um, a purveyor of art, art from uh, Asia. And he could be seen in the store wearing his trademark red carnation, uh, greeting Gump's customers. Um, his son, Richard, became president of the store in 1947 and he was quite the Renaissance man. He was a musician, artist, serious composer, designer, uh, bon vivant, and lecturer uh, with a sense of humor. He was conductor of the Guggenheimer Sauerkraut Band, whose members wore ill-fitting military uniforms from the, that looked like they were from the Franco-Prussian War, and they purposely played music off key. And they played at charity events around town and even cut some records. So he, he definitely was uh, a man around town. Here we have Marianne and Isaac Magnan, and they were the founders of I Magnan. It was named, the I is the, in the name is for Isaac, even though Marianne was definitely the driving force. They emigrated from Germany in 1875 with their seven children coming around Cape Horn. And they first opened a tiny neighborhood store in Oakland, then moved to San Francisco and opened a store south of Market. And they sold notions, pins and needles and things like that. But Marianne was really an expert seamstress. Uh, she made layettes and lingerie and shirtwaists and the ladies of the uh, Barbary Coast really liked her lingerie. Um, and Isaac was actually a gilder by profession and he worked for the Gumps but he preferred riding his bicycle in Union Square, handing out political tracts. So Marianne was really the driving force. And since the Knob Hill matrons, who were the new nobility, the wives of the mining kings and railroad czars, they took notice and word quickly spread about Marianne's needlework. And the, um, they stopped carrying notions and really focused on quality uh, lingerie and shirtwaists. And, to Marianne, quality was everything. She was a powerful force teaching all her children about the business. She really liked to keep her brood close by. And one story goes that in um, 1913, her son Grover, who later became president of the store, he moved into his own suite at the St. Francis um, that was right next to his mother's. Uh, and there was supposedly an unlocked door between their apartments so that Marianne could freely visit. But that uh, tradition stopped when Grover got married in 1931. So Marianne couldn't uh, just go back and forth as much as she wanted. But even after Marianne retired, she still visited the San Francisco flagship uh, Magnum store on Union Square. She lived in her apartment at the St. Francis, a half a block away, so it wasn't too much of a trek. So here we have F.W. Dorman. This is my great-great-grandfather on my father's side. And he emigrated from Germany in 1862, first to Ohio, then on to San Francisco. And he became a merchant uh, specializing in China. He had a company called the Nathan Dorman Company and was extremely involved in civic activities from the University of California, where he was a regent, to the San Francisco Hotel Company, which operated the St. Francis. Now, the, the Emporium was kind of a different 
different uh, type of store than the other ones. It was uh, south of the slot, it was called, which are the streetcar tracks along Market Street. And that was really considered a riskier area for retail. It was not a Union Square. And, um, but they decided to aim for a more middle-class clientele, even though it wasn't on Union Square. And uh, they made a go of it. Um, but at first, the store was founded by a German immigrant, Adolf Feist, who leased the Parrot Building at 835 Market Street in 1893, and he wanted to turn it into a large department store. But his concept was to have a lot of separate shops, all individually owned, without central management, and it went broke within three years. Um, so Dorman, with some partners, took over and merged it with the Golden Rule Bazaar, which was down the street, and launched a combined enterprise a year later. But the big difference was central management and a lot of luxurious amenities. They had restrooms, which weren't all that, um, which were unusual at the time, sitting rooms, art rooms, uh, an orchestra, and often, um, and everything to appeal to middle class shoppers, not just the very wealthy. Then we have other, the other Magnans, Joseph Magnan. Now he was a son of Isaac and Mary Ann, one of their many children. But he felt that um, he wasn't going to get any um, opportunity at iMagnan to really be a leader. So he set off on his own in 1913. And he and his son, Cyril, uh, really made the store what it was. Um, Cyril loved San Francisco, and probably many of you remember him. He could be seen everywhere, from the flagship store selling floor to the opera and official receptions. He was San Francisco's chief of protocol to many, many performances at Beach Blanket Babylon. I think he went to more than 400, and there's a um, box seat there named after him. He also walked to work every day from his apartment at the Mark Hopkins while his driver would give his dog a ride in the car. I think Herb Cain uh, sums it up nicely about all these uh, individuals who really ran the stores and put their own stamp on them. He said, not all that long ago, you could have walked into the Bank of America on Montgomery and shaken hands with AP Giannini. Yes, AP in person, sitting at a desk in the middle of the main floor. Grover Magnin would show you around his beloved I Magnin store, the most beautiful in the world, he'd say, and he meant it. And Cyril Magnin was delighted to wait on you at J Magnin. I or J, Magnin's the way, beamed Cyril. There were live Gumps at Gumps, Prentice Hale at Hale Brothers, Michelle Weil at the White House, founded by his uncle, and Paul Verdier parading his poodle at the city of Paris or buying you a champagne in Normandy Lane. So let's look a little back at San Francisco and why these stores thrived. Basically, the city after the gold rush was really ready for merchants there to establish their retail empires. In the last half of the 19th century, San Francisco's population exploded from more than 100,000 at the end of the 1860s to close to 300,000 in the 1890s. Uh, all those new residents, many with new fortunes, had money to spend, and they needed household goods and tailors. Uh, they needed hatters, they needed dress and shirt makers and jewelers. Um, and that's why they, these stores took off. What, what made a store great? This, this picture here is um, at the Emporium. It's the jewelry counter there under the dome. What made a store great? It had to be in a central location serviced by mass transportation. It needed a very visible owner who built relationships with the community and employees. It needed to carry a great variety of goods to entice customers into the store. They offered free services such as delivery, uh, deliveries, liberal credit arrangements, and merchandise return privileges. And last but not least, salespeople were there to provide individual attention. It really was a different era. Um, many women did not work outside the home in, in a certain demographic. They didn't work outside the home and could enjoy a day-long shopping trip with afternoon tea or a concert. 
there was a feeling of trust between the sellers and buyers and between employers and employees. And employees often worked at the same store for their entire careers. This is a picture of Podesta Baldaki here, the flower store. So let's take a closer look at the different stores and their niches. Let's start with City of Paris. These are in the order of their founding. So City of Paris was ostensibly founded in 1850 because that spring, La Ville de Paris, the City of Paris, a three-mast schooner chartered by Emile and Félix Verdier arrived in San Francisco Harbor, and they had a lot of goods from Paris. And San Franciscans were so excited that they actually rowed out to the boat to buy all the laces and wines and, and alcohol before it could be unloaded. So basically, the city of Paris retail enterprise was born. Imagine those miners fresh from the gold fields encountering the goods that the city of Paris had to uh, offer. The bonnets, the shawls, the woolen stockings, neckerchiefs, laces, and silks, plus all the, uh, the fine alcohols that they uh, were able to procure. They all wanted them for their wives or sweethearts, and the Verdiers had the resources to provide them. So they just kept going back to France to get more, uh, more goods to sell. So April 18th, 1906, we all know what happened then. And we're lucky to have a memoir from Paul Verdier of the city of Paris, where he talks about his experience that day. He was only 24 years old, but he lived at the St. Francis. They all seemed to live in hotels, but he was rudely awakened by an armoire toppling over. As he recalled, he said, I only had one thought, burglars but it didn't take long before I realized that it was an earthquake. The noise was like the rush of wind through a forest with the difference that instead of trees, it was steel beams that were groaning. I went immediately to the store, which was a block from my hotel. The window mannequins had fallen face down as fallen soldiers and the wall of a neighboring building had smashed through a skylight, but there was very little damage. Well, what Paul didn't know and no one knew was it was really the fires that were going to do the damage. So um, he did not know of the conflagration that was to come. And he actually went with his father, who was visiting from Paris, got a few things from the store, and then went off to have lunch at Marchands, the uh, city's best French restaurant. And it was actually the last meal the restaurant served before it burned. That evening, he was heading back in his buggy in the direction of Union Square, and the sky was black and ashes were everywhere, and a, a burned piece of paper fell into his carriage, and it was actually an invoice from the city of Paris. He could tell by the motto and the, the logo, and he asked a policeman what was going on. He said he was on the way to the store, and the policeman told him it had already burned. The store recovered, of course, and went on for many decades, seven more decades, on the corner of Geary and Stockton. It featured clothing for the entire family in the famous Normandy Lane, which Herb Cain mentioned, where one could find all things French. The holidays were really a high point. They were known for their Christmas tree. It was a four-story, 35-foot tree that miraculously appeared completely decorated on the Monday after Thanksgiving. And they had a big crew of over 20 who worked all weekend to get it ready, uh, decorating it with over 5,000 colored glass balls, toys, everything uh, on, the, um, on the branches. Uh, the traffic was stopped on Geary Boulevard as the tree was carried into the store. So it really had many good years before beginning to fail. And what happened? Like so many of these stores, you'll hear, a, you'll hear a, a, a theme here. It just couldn't compete with the chains and changing demographics. They sent out a pretty defiant note at the end that I'd like to read because I think it captures the, uh, the Frenchness. <laughs> the descendants of Félix Verdier, the founder of City of Paris, sadly announced that after 122 years of catering to the good tastes and elegant requirements of many generations of San Franciscans, City of Paris will close its door, doors in the early spring of 1972. The time has now come when this Verdier family-owned quality store must leave the San Francisco scene 
which had dominated for more than a century. We are solvent. No one can force us to go out of business. We are doing it voluntarily. There will be no bankruptcy or receivership. We shall honor all of our ab obligations as we have in the past and bow out in a dignified and honorable manner befitting our San Francisco tradition. Thank you and au revoir. So that wasn't really the end of the story. Yes, the business closed, but the building was the subject of a huge planning fight because Neiman Marcus bought it and said they were gonna maintain its gorgeous Beaux-Arts uh, look and feel, but they found there were too many um, problems getting it earthquake safe and things like that. So they petitioned to make major changes to it and that was the subject of a big fight. But what we have now is the Philip Johnson designed building there on the corner with some things from the old store. It was, it was not well received the new design. Let's talk about the White House and Raphael Weil. Um, I mentioned him earlier. He arrived in San Francisco in 1854. He was very outgoing and personable. He was a popular uh, figure, one of San Francisco's leading citizens. He set the tone for customer service and graciousness. Um, an often cited story about his philanthropy was that um, after the 06 quake, he quietly ordered a shipment of 5,000 dresses and undergarments, 16,000 items total to be brought around the horn and distributed to female refugees. I, I, I kind of emphasize the word quietly because um, he didn't seem to do anything terribly quietly. He loved the media. He really knew how to use the media. His name appeared more often when I was reading, researching the book than any other person. And he, the typical headlines in the flowery prose of the day were like, um, Raphael Weil, 80 years old, congratulations are cabled, veteran merchant prince gives 10,000 to San Francisco charities on his birthday. Um, France honors Raphael Weil, well-known merchant is made chevalier of Legion of Honor. So there was a lot of press about him. Um, he actually lived at the Bohemian Club the men's club on Taylor Street, and was known for cooking up large multi-course breakfasts for his friends. There was even a, um, a dish named after him, Chicken Raphael Weil, and heaven help you if you were late. Um, he quit the club suddenly when his nephew and heir, Michelle Weil, was turned down for membership around 1918. And I, I, it was hard for me to find out exactly what happened, but what I surmised was anti-Semitism was on the rise and the club was beginning to uh, not take people of Jewish people as members, unfortunately. So uh, Raphael Weil died in 1920 and Michelle took over, but no one was as visible in SF uh, as a merchant than Raphael. The huge store, it was actually four different buildings, was located on the corner of Grant and Sutter. And a, they had a fleet of distinctive uh, delivery trucks, white of course, that traveled throughout the city for many years delivering goods, over 28 million packages. And during World War II, the trucks were outfitted to be ambulances if necessary. Uh, in 1946, the store let UPS take over, citing more efficient service and less traffic congestion, but they, uh, gave all their drivers, uh, they were guaranteed a job at the same salary. I love this picture. This is from the Bancroft and this is the glove department. And I spoke with a woman named Lolly Erlanger who worked at the store in the fragrance department as a teenager during World War II. And she said she was fascinated by the White House's glove department. When you wanted to buy gloves, you placed your elbow on a little pad and then the saleswoman would work the leather glove over your hands. She remembered the uh, floor walkers on the main floor. It was men in business suits with white boutonnieres uh, who made their rounds to make sure everything was running smoothly. So this was one of the first stores to close. Uh, by the mid 20th century, the store had really lost its cachet. It had an inefficient floor plan. As I said, four buildings, four leases, and they lost 2 million trying to expand to Oakland. So after 111 years, they closed in 1965. 
During the last days, lines went out the door and Pinkerton guards helped control the bedlam and 850 employees were out of a job. So here we have A.L. Gump there. Uh, when I was growing up, when a young woman in San Francisco from a certain social set got engaged, it was just assumed she would register for her wedding gifts at Gump's. On the second floor of the flagship store, 250 Post, um, very knowledgeable salespeople would lead the newly engaged woman through the myriad China offerings from Lennox and Wedgwood to Heron, Seraline, and Haviland. And a full room was dedicated to Baccarat Crystal. Um, A.L. Gump, who's up in the top left here, could be seen greeting customers in the store. And he had a phrase that usually proved irresistible. He'd say, now I really want you to have this. And uh, one story is that one time he was helping a well-known actress, actress and used that line on her as she tried on a jade necklace. She said, thank you very much and walked out of the store assuming it was a gift from the benevolent retailer. So Richard Gump, who became president in 1947, he came up with the tagline, good taste costs no more. He wanted to kind of expand their uh, base and, um, but still be the promoters of good taste. And he was very strict about whom they hired. He didn't want people who worked in merchandising who had poor taste and big reputations. And he actually, in 1951, decided that all current employees and applicants had to take his 137 question design test. So he said in his oral history, I picked out about 200 pictures of all kinds of things, rooms, objects, old and modern, and the test subjects are supposed to select and say whether they're good or bad. I never found anybody with good taste who did badly on the test or anybody with poor taste who did well on it. I wanted somebody who had a feel for merchandising as well as a feel for the use of things. So the store was sold in 1969 and went through various owners. It moved in 1994 from its flagship building at 250 post to 135 post. Um, Richard Gump's assistant said about him, he went by instinct. He felt that if it was the right thing to do, it was the right thing to do. In my opinion, Mr. Gump's retirement from the store left a void in San Francisco's arts and antique circles, and it will never be the same. Since its so-called demise in late 2018, after 157 years, it's actually had a bit of a resurgence because it opened in a very small space at the original building. One of the investors bought the brand. And um, we will see, I'm not sure if it was just a pop-up store for Christmas or if it's, if it's ongoing, but it's just a, a shadow of what it was. I. Magnan. Who was the I. Magnan woman? She was elegant. She trusted I. Magnan to choose items of the highest quality, whether it was a bottle of perfume or a dress. She was a dedicated customer who, after her initial visit, would often just call her salesperson to order. Her salesperson would keep her notes in a blue book, uh, which kept all her clients' preferences. The iMagnon woman might have a trust fund, which only paid out once a year, so she would charge everything at iMagnon, and then they would wait to be paid until her annual check came in. If she needed a new lipstick, she would call in her order, her driver could pull up at the door and the iMagman doorman would hand her, him, the driver, the package. The store was in various locations, but by the 40s, it was time for a new flagship store in San Francisco. Uh, Grover Magnum was president at that point and he had his eye on the 10-story Butler building at Stockton and Geary. And he and architect Timothy Pfluger got to work. Now Grover, like Herb Cain, hated pigeons and made sure that new building facade would not be a welcome place for the bird. He said, um, when I hired Tim Pfluger to build this store, I told him to make it pigeon proof. I live at the St. Francis and I could see what the birds had done to that building. So Magnus has no ledges or cornices where a pigeon can get a toehold. Uh, Blums was on the same block as you can see here. And uh, that's where a lot of us like to go for co a coffee crunch cake. 
It was really a beautiful store. Uh, walls of marble, glass murals, a molded silver leaf ceiling, pink marble floor. And the fifth floor women's restroom and lounge was an art deco oasis. And uh, many people have, fond, many women have fond memories of that restroom. Uh, Grover was like his mother, obsessed with quality. He would call his top people together and give a little class in quality detection. He'd, he'd do things like spread out a handful of different grade pearl necklaces, turn the price tags down and show them how to select the best. The same thing was done with other products, alligator skins, fur pelts, even samples of tortoise shell. He would tell them where the products came from their, and their history and their romance. It didn't matter what department you were in. He wanted everyone to know about this. He said, when you sell a customer a 3500 Balagencia or Dior, she has the right to expect reliable counsel on the accessories to go with it. So what brought on iMagnon's demise? Again, they, they merged with Bullocks in 1944, expanded very rapidly, and changed hands many times. It was the usual story. Changing demographics and competition from low price competitors, they couldn't make it work, and it closed in 1994. The building was taken over by Macy's, and now I think Macy's has sold off part of it, so it's just, it's, it's not, anything like it used to be. So here we have the Emporium south of the slot on uh, Market Street. Many native San Franciscans have fond memories of the Big E. I uh, asked for some uh, stories on Facebook and was deluged with them. Uh, it was the place where you shop for back to school clothes, probably in the bar bargain basement. Got your first grown up jacket and last Last, but definitely not least, rode the big slide or the train on the roof at Christmas. The store's location on Market Street, away from Union Square, helped its image, uh, helped foster its image as a store aimed at the more middle class. Um, it was in a building designed by Albert Pisces, who also did the flood building, the White House, and the Mechanics Institute. So here we have a picture of the um, uh, dome, the bandstand in the dome. The store had its own orchestra. John Marquart was director. This is a 1905 photo. And Mrs. Marquart, Mrs. Marquart was the harpist. Uh, concerts were held three times a week on the elevated bronze stand. As I said, when I posted on Facebook looking for memories, I got a lot of entries and I, I found this one pretty funny. Uh, this is where someone says, I remember my mom taking me down there to find those bargain basement sales for clothing and such. My favorite memory, somewhat violent, was when they were having a sale on flatware and mom found a style she liked, but the challenge then became to find, became to find eight matching place settings. They'd thrown assorted such styles into this large bin and you had to rake through it to find what you wanted. My mom handed me this large salad serving fork, showed me how to stab into a section and then pull it towards me so I could sift through the utensils and other people's hands in order to fulfill her twisted desires. So that's one <laughs> San Franciscan's memories. Christmas, let's talk Christmas. It was a very big deal at the Emporium and Santa was a total rock star. Uh, one Chronicle article said in terms of crowd size and fervor, it looked like a cross between a World Series victory parade and a visit by the Pope. This is when Santa would arrive. He always rode in style, whether it was a horse and carriage or the cable car Santa Kate in the 40s and 50s. Part of Market Street and Powell Street were shut down and tens of thousands of people were there waiting to see Santa arrive. Um, and they, they just had to keep upping their game uh, with things that were special to wow the crowds from 5,000 helium balloons to a baby elephant or ice skating queens. So the Emporium, it too failed. Uh, the inner city continued to decline in the 50s and 60s while the suburbs boomed. And they did expand uh, by 69 when Broadway Hale stores purchased them. There were 11 branch stores, plus the downtown SF and the Emporium Capwell in Oakland. They, they had actually merged with Capwell in, right before the depression. 
uh, in anticipation of the Bay Bridge being built. Um, by 1991, they were burdened by significant debt from too rapid expansion, plus the Loma Prieta earthquake damaged a lot of the stores and they really had a hard time uh, getting back up on their feet. Um, Federated department stores, which owned Macy's, bought it and dissolved the chain in 96. Um, so the Grand, Dame, Grand Dame of Market Street was no more. It sat sadly empty until September 2006 when the Westfield San Francisco Westfield San Francisco complex, which was a $440 million office retail entertainment uh, complex opened after years of negotiation uh, and bureaucratic wrangling. Joseph Magnan, as I said, Joseph was a son of Marianne and Isaac and he struck out on his own in 1913 because he realized that Marianne favored another son to run I Magnan. And the store really muddled along until his son, Cyril, took it over. This was around World War II. And he realized that there were a lot of young people in San Francisco and he revamped it. And he rebranded it really so it would be young and edgy. And one example that I find uh, really amusing is there was something called the Wolves Den. And this is, this is uh, Cyril in the Wolves Den, Wolves Den in the lower right. And basically it was promoted as, as a shopping refuge accessible only by invitation. And it was a quote, special gentleman's shopping retreat filled with gifts from throughout JM, helpful hostesses and spirited refreshments. So basically attractive young women served cocktails uh, to men and then searched the store to bring gifts for them to peruse and purchase. And I mean, Nowadays, this is, uh, would be uh, not really acceptable, but um, at the time it was really in keeping with their sassy marketing and distinct brand. But Ellen Magna Newman also told me that it was about reducing returns as much as increasing sales because they were really helping these men find gifts that maybe their wives or sweethearts would like. So JM was really known as the fun place to shop. Uh, Cyril and his uh, family was a, were very savvy merchandisers. Cyril loved to hire young people, especially women, and set them loose to be creative. Um, they didn't have to punch a clock, but they were expected to produce. Um, they were really known for their graphics and their designs and their Christmas boxes. So here we have some of the boxes, which are from Mrs. Newman's collection. And they were initially designed by uh, Margaret Larson and really became collector's items. But you know, they weren't really just for show. Uh, Mrs. Newman said they were more practical than wrapping because it took less time for the salespeople to, um, to get the packages ready because customers could assemble their boxes at home. Over the years, there were many designs and they were award-winning designs. There were pyramids, a gingerbread toyland village, um, a photo album and a Tom and Jerry mug. Some of you might have some of these at home. Their advertising department really broke all the rules. I love this picture. Uh, the ads were anything but stayed. They were edgy, they were colorful, they were witty and they were full of movement. The JM woman had full hair, big eyes, and was forward thinking. So the two designers who were the most responsible for this, Margaret Larson and Betty Brader Ashley, their ads are actually in the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of American History. So again, by 69, they had over 30 stores, and all the although the family wasn't looking to sell, suitors were making offers. And Amfac, based in Hawaii, made a very good offer and, want, and said they wanted to keep management. But the management styles were really different. Um, JM prided, prided itself on its creative anarchy. That was one of Cyril's um, terms. And that was markedly different than Amfac's buttoned up corporate style. And Amfac also had a totally different merchandising approach. So within six months, the Magnum executive team was demoted and offered lesser positions and they all left. Um, the store expanded, continued to expand very quickly and ended up closing in 1984. 
Cyril said to one of the AMFAC executives, Joseph Magnin is like a finely tuned clock. And if you start playing with it, it's going to start stop ticking. So I think that kind of uh, says it all. That's it for the six stores, but I sort of wanted to wrap up a bit and talk about how tempting it is to play the if only game. If only the next generation of families who had founded the old stores had been interested in continuing the, the tradition. If only the families hadn't sold to corporate entities that changed the character. If only they hadn't expanded so quickly, depleting cash and taking on too much risk. If only real estate in San Francisco hadn't gotten so pricey and on and on. But the reality is that the grand downtown department stores no longer have a place in the retail panorama. Uh, retail is struggling mightily anyway, but um, department stores across the United States have been losing market share for decades to basically changing shopping habits, e-commerce, discount chains, and other retailing upstarts. It's really a brutal environment, and um, I think we're gonna see many more uh, chapter 11s as uh, the pandemic sorts itself out. So uh, Sears is just a shadow, Macy's is closed, um, about a fifth of its stores, Pier 1 is closing stores, Gimbel's, Bonwit Teller, Henri Bendel, A.T. Stewart, B. Altman, they all closed years ago. Barney's has filed for bankruptcy, and some malls are being reborn with more entertainment options, um, but uh, it's, it's, I, I'm not sure how this is all gonna work out. Um, so I wanna do a plug for independent bookstores like Copperfields. My mother had a bookstore on Union Street for years called Minerva's Owl, and I'm a big proponent of uh, independent bookstores. So I hope that you will, um, you know, make a point of buying your books through them. Okay, I'm gonna come back on the screen here. Hi. Jamie, are you there? I'm here, thank you so much, Anne. That was fascinating. Was that, was that fun? That's Good. Yeah, that was Good. great. It was so fun to work on it. There are, there were, I mean, this is just, a few of the stories. I mean, there were there were so many stories. I bet, and we have so many great comments and feedback and, and memories shared by attendees listening right now. It's it's great. We also have quite a few questions, so okay. um, let's maybe get to it. Um, so a couple people are interested in if you cover H Leaves and Co. No, I didn't. I couldn't find much material on that, and and the publisher kind of limited my words. I mean, meaning I was given, I couldn't go over a certain manuscript length. So I decided to just focus on these six, but maybe that's for another book. Um, another listener is wondering uh, if you have any information on the origins of bridal registrations at various department stores. And she's wondering, oh. could it have been modeled after Gump's? Isn't that an interesting question? Um, no, I don't know how those started. Um, uh, I really don't, but Gums definitely was, they had the bridal registry business and, and I have to laugh because when our daughter got married a few years ago, she wanted to register on Etsy if she was gonna register at all. So it's, it's just this completely different mindset. Um, but the, the world of fine china and Baccarat crystal, I think, uh, People don't set tables quite like that anymore. So I don't know how wedding registries started. Um, Kathy is wondering which of these stores still exist? None of them does, except maybe Gump's in its new iteration, but I, I, they really all are closed. Or I mean, when I finished the manuscript, Gump's was closed, <clears throat> and then it sort of rose from the ashes in this um, reduced format. You know, we're getting so much great feedback of people just thanking you for sharing all of these oh, good. stories and how fun it was to hear the history. Um, another listener wants to know, uh, when did the Emporium open its store in Stonestown? 
that would have been in the 50s. Um, San Francisco did a big push west. You know, the, the tunnel was built and streetcars were going out there. And so uh, the movement was to uh, build out to the west. So there's a, in my Emporium book, there's a wonderful kind of um, PR photo of these planners looking at um, a big uh, model of Stonestown. And the big deal was to have parking. You know, it was just a huge parking lot. And um, that was just, that was their first uh, foray into a branch store was uh, Stonestown. Awesome. Um, Norman, or excuse me, Norma also says the new version of Gumps is still open. I get it well from them on a regular basis. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, good. I'd like to see them make it. Um, <laughs> it just, it's just a shadow of what it was, but I think they, they think the brand is worth something. It really was recognized as high quality giftware and things. Another anonymous attendee is wondering if you see any way that these wonderful family type department stores could ever return. Don't you think once new generation experience the personal service and the atmosphere, they might appreciate and dump the box stores? And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, Ellen Newman, Mrs. Newman had some opinions on that and she thinks she, she's quite a marketing person. Um, and she thinks that it could work if someone found the right combination with, you know, online and in store and everything. But, the, you know, when I talked to her, that was two years ago and the economy has um, taken a bit of a nosedive since then. Uh, so I don't know, but it would be interesting to see somebody try. It's just not a great environment right now. Okay, Charlene is wondering, uh, which department store would have been the most expensive to shop and which would have been the most family reasonable? Emporium was definitely the most family reasonable. Um, I'd say iMagnon was the most expensive. Gums could get really up there too if you were buying the jade necklace or the jade Buddha or something like that. But as far as clothing, it would have been iMagnon. Interesting. Um, Genevieve is wondering if there are any films on the rooftop games. Oh, on the, on the Emporium rooftop? Um, no, there's lots of pictures of the San Francisco Public Library, but I haven't seen any films. Um, Nancy is wondering if the White House in Santa Rosa was connected to the one in San Francisco. I don't think so. As, as from my research, they just had one branch in Oakland that was not successful Aww. near the Kaiser Center. So I don't know what the one in Santa Rosa, I mean, Emporium definitely had a uh, Santa Rosa uh, store, but I hadn't heard anything about White House being there. Um, yeah, kind of a similar question. Um, Meredith is wondering, if there's any hidden remnants of, uh, of some of these stores left in the buildings or current businesses besides the dome of the Emporium. That's interesting because I, when I was working on the book, I was told that one could still get in to the women's restroom at iMagnum on the fifth floor. This was like three years ago. And so I set out to find it and I could not I could not find it. So I finally went to the information desk and the woman sort of rolled her eyes and she said, no, 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 no. You know, it's not, it's not accessible anymore because they, they had sort of sold the building and cut up different things. So I, I was hoping that that Art Deco uh, oasis was still available. But um, yeah, so the Emporium, the dome, I don't think it looks quite like it used to, but it is there. City of Paris has some... Um, you know, the balconies, they, they kept some of the uh, features of the old store, but the exterior is completely different. Charlene is wondering, um, I guess we'll wrap it up with this one. I want to be conscious of your time. That's okay. um, why was Oakland the starting point for the department stores versus San Francisco straight away? Oakland, well, it wasn't all the stores. I mean, uh, the Magnans had a small store there. Um, F.W. Dorman started there. I think it was just maybe a, a better place to start something, but they all moved into San Francisco eventually. Um, but 
I don't really know. And there weren't any bridges, so it wasn't all that easy to get back and forth, except well, everybody took ferries, of course. But um, uh, I think it was just probably less cost of entry. Awesome. We're just getting so many comments of people oh. sharing their experiences <laughs> and how, how thrilled they are with the, the historical presentation and how much fun this has been. Oh, that's great. I'm so happy. Yeah, I really want to thank you for taking the time to, you know, have a virtual event with us. I know it's a little weird in this environment. But... I greatly prefer that this to having, you know, six people in masks sitting six feet apart. I'm thrilled that there's however many, 69 participants. So that's, that's great. Yeah, it's really great. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Anne has agreed to sign book plates for people, for those of you who purchased tonight's title. And what you'll need to do um, is just email me and I will be sending around an email tomorrow to all of you that includes a link to this recording. Um, and it will also include further information for how to get your um, signed copy. So I really appreciate you all joining us tonight. And um, yeah, be on the lookout for that email. And thank you so much, Anne. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Have a good evening.